Hello, this is Don Shanahan of EveryMovieHasALesson.com and the Chicago Independent Film Critics Circle. This is another edition of the Movie Classroom, an interactive whiteboard uh, visual presentation matched with the audio reading of my written review. Uh, this week, we have, in my eyes, the last big hitter of the summer of 2017, and that is Christopher Nolan's Dunkirk. Um, this is a very challenging review that's getting rave, rev challenging review for me that's getting rave reviews elsewhere. Um, you go to Metacritic, you go to Rotten Tomatoes, you're going to see a lot of 90s, you're going to see a lot of 5s and 10s and 100s. This is a 3 star out of 5 star film for me, and I'd love to tell you why. Here's my review. Director Christopher Nolan recently addressed critics who called his films, quote, emotionless by likening his films to Rorschach tests with freedom for audiences to interpret each their own way. I don't know what films those so-called critics watch. They must have missed the sharp revenge of Memento, the stirring heroic feels of his Batman trilogy, the suspenseful mental weight of Inception, the jealousy and the prestige and the family anguish of Interstellar. Emotionless, my ass, is the answer to that. That said, and it pains me to say this, Dunkirk has the flaws to unfortunately fan those flames and keep that label of emotionless hovering around Christopher Nolan. As technically proficient and respectful to history as Dunkirk is, no substantial human anchors of emotion emerge in this film that wants to be seen as an inspiring rescue saga before a war film or historical epic. The totems of fear and survival are ever present and done very well, but there are no magnetic characters to carry those existential burdens. It is a critical flaw in an otherwise astounding dramatic thriller. It's been 10 years since Joe Wright's Atonement and 59 years since Leslie Norman's Dunkirk when it comes to cinema presenting a silver screen tale from the 10 day long 1940 Operation Dynamo World War II storybook that is the Battle of Dunkirk set in the French city whose name translates to mean Church and Dunes. The encyclopedia links you'll find in my review or even ones you look up on your own uh, fill you in on the history involved in this story and honestly knowing the basics will greatly aid in appreciating and absorbing Nolan's film. Put the wrench time in, put the study time in, it'll help you. Dunkirk presents its history by land, sea, and air, and it wouldn't be a Nolan film without the narrative bending its linearity into an overlapping Mobius strip. Over 400,000 British and French soldiers are trapped in an ocean French ocean front siege by the advancing German forces. Leading our point of view among the troops is Tommy, played by Fionn Whitehead in his future film debut. The logistical outlook for retreat and evacuation is grim as observed by the top brass, embodied by Kenneth Branagh and James Darcy. The tides and sandbars make the beaches too shallow to approach with large vessels, leaving the ones that enter the few remaining piers sitting ducks for submarine torpedoes and aerial bombing from the Luftwaffe. Seeing all transpiring below and staunchly defending the skies for the home team, if you want to call it, are a trio of outnumbered RAF pilots led by Tom Hardy. Desperate for help of any kind, the people of Britain respond across the English Channel by sending over what became known as the Little Ships of Dunkirk, over 700 civilian and public boats of all shapes and sizes, from yachts to ferries, to enter the conflict, risk their own lives, and rescue their countrymen. The on-deck and at-the-helm perspective for that effort centers on one boat manned by Bridge of Spies Oscar winner Mark Rylance and his two-man teenage crew, played by newcomer Tom Glenn Carney and 71's Barry Keoghan. Um, the first survivor they encounter is a shivering, PTSD-stricken Cillian Murphy as they steam closer to greater danger in the northern of France. On all three fronts, this is an ensemble cast of entirely composite characters that go mostly nameless. This is definitely a fictitious dramatization of the real events. To manufacture hero heroic flutters from nondescript archetypes like that, compelling performances are then needed. The problem is, it doesn't help that the three loosely defined, quote, heroes of this screen story are comprised of a nearly indistinguishable unknown in Whitehead, the half dozen lines of dialogue underneath a pilot's mask from Tom Hardy, and the milk toast blankness and low register of Mark Rylance. Sure, actions speak louder than words, but none of the three garners pal palpable appeal or connection as praiseworthy heroes. Hardy comes the closest, but again, there's just not enough. Frankly, it is difficult to make an engaging historical, historical epic worthy of inspiring audience investment with 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 someone they can go um, without someone they can go home and Google to learn more about. I know we should all be sharper on our history, but let's be honest: you see something in a movie, you want to go home and learn more about it. If a movie inspires you enough, 
Lawrence of Arabia has a real T.E. Lawrence you can look up. Braveheart has a real William Wallace. The movies do them in completely different ways, but there's something you can go home and find. Those are anchors, and Dunkirk lacks them, which is unfortunate given the massive true story being told. If you need a real story from the Battle of Dunkirk to really marvel at, look up the Sundowner Yacht. If you need a documentary about a man who survived Dunkirk, look up, look up a Dr. Sword from Ireland last year. If you want a film, speaking of composite characters, if you want a film filled with non-specific composite characters with wondrously greater performances that really build anchors, go revisit Steven Spielberg's Saving Private Ryan. Dunkirk can't match that at all. That's where you'll find superior examples of resonance from both fact and fiction. Piling on, Dunkirk's Mobius strip of time loops does not do does not do the lack of performance resonance any favors, honestly. The off-kilter pace steals focus and makes what should be standout peaks repetitive moments instead. The onus there falls on Nolan's written treatment and the wayward editing of his longtime collaborator Lee Smith. Parts of this film are really a mess to track. What greatly overcomes these failings, and I mean this sincerely, are Dunkirk's incomparable production, incomparable production value and technical prowess. Christopher Nolan has long had refined taste. He is an ardent student of grand movie making craft and a purveying purist of traditional celluloid film. The period detail is off the charts, and Nolan employed a David Lean level fleet of costume extras in the thousands. The director cited 11 films that inspired the look and feel of Dunkirk, a primer ranging from 1924 silent film Greed and the battlefield classic of All Quiet on the Western Front, all the way to the modern kinetic energy of Speed and Unstoppable. Dunkirk exudes a range of those styles that are never static and honestly entirely engrossing. Mood and suspense will never be Nolan's weaknesses. In a minimalist narrative of very little exposition and dialogue, Hans Zibber's throbbingly intense musical score is rapturously overpowering and off, often acting as a strong, solitary voice of heavy breathing within the film. Zimmer's score is but a piece of the continual audio fury of Dunkirk's pounding sound palette, edited by Richard Kind and mixed by Mark Weingarten. These were the loudest seat-rattling bullets, squibs, and bombs I've witnessed on screen in a long time. Interstellar, interstellar cinematographer Hoyt Van Hotema collaborate, collaborated with Nolan again to shoot Dunkirk entirely on IMAX and large format 65mm stock. His lenses absorb cramped moments of doom that choke with claustrophobia, wartime vistas of smoke and haze, amphibious seas of white-capped waves and soaring skies populated by growling aircraft dogfights. The sensory depth and details are pristine in every millisecond of this film. If you must, see this film on the largest and loudest screen you can. That's the main body of my review for Dunkirk here, as I always do in my reviews, are the life lessons I take away from it. Lesson number one is fighting against helplessness. Dunkirk has a level of scratching and clawing and persevering for survival against insurmountable odds and fears that are right there with other war films. Such initiatives are the reasons people take chances with their lives in these extenuating circumstances and difficult situations. Survival is not fair, and the moments of challenge and peril are nearly relentless in this film. It does that part right. Lesson number two, and that's the idea of what really occurred to this is when deliverance is needed. England, you know, turning back to the history book here, England would have been crippled and defenseless if those nearly half million men were lost at Dunkirk. The successful evacuation spurred a British rebound in the war, a moment not lost on Prime Minister Winston Churchill in his famous We Shall Fight on the Beaches speech that followed the successful Operation Dynamo. The combined rescue efforts of civilian volunteers pulled off what many consider to be a military miracle. Nolan labels it deliverance, and he's dead right. Lesson number three, and this is the people part that's there that came, stems from the history that the film wants to, that wants to show. I don't know if it nails it, but it's definitely a lesson you can soak up. And that is, public citizens are an element of hope during war. The people of England rose to action in patriotic solidarity against adversity when it came to the Battle of Dunkirk. After this incident in history, the term Dunkirk spirit was coined, referring to a, quote, an attitude of being very strong in a difficult situation and refusing to accept defeat. Success became possible because the national mindset was unified. 
and united, from the waiting soldiers on those beaches across the sea to the public support waiting, waiting for and then called to act back at home. Dunkirk really is an outstanding big screen experience. Um, the, the, the power of it is there. I just feel like it lacks the emotional anchors to really put it over the top. Um, I know a lot of people out there are going to call this a masterpiece from Nolan or call it one of his best films, if not his best film. I can't do that. Um, I downright almost want to call this his worst film. But for me, that's not a very long way down. That's like going from a sleep number king size mattress to a pillow top king size mattress. It's not a very large dip because he has made so many good films. But this just isn't one of them. I hope you enjoyed this review. If you have comments and things, seek me out. I'd love to hear some feedback. You can find me everywhere where you look for Every Movie Has a Lesson between Facebook, here on YouTube, uh, Twitter, and etc. So thank you very much for the listening and following this review. Hope to hear from you. Thank you.